So I'll be talking to you today about the star that makes life possible, the sun. Um, how many of you just kind of stare at the sun and think, you know, how does it work? How is it, you know, up there? Right? That's why I wear glasses. I did that too much as a kid. All right, so topics covered. We're going to start with how did the sun form? Is the sun unique? How does the sun even work? You're going to be a solar engineer by the time we're done here. Will the sun swallow the earth? I've heard people, I'll, I'll start, let's do a vote. Who thinks the sun's going to swallow the earth? All right, who thinks the sun won't swallow the earth? All right, we got some optimists here. Uh, and then my, my to the topic of my PhD, uh, what's left when the sun no longer shines? Like what happens when it you know, runs out of steam? If you have other questions, ask me anytime. Just shout, you know, stand up, raise your hand. And we're going to walk through this through, um, I'm going to give you all solar facts. You're going to remember these, and these are all, they're all going to be on the next set of uh, questions for the pub trivia. So write these down. These are going to be, um, you're going to be quizzed on these. Uh, solar fact number one is the sun is a perfect sphere. Uh, there's an asterisk on that. So give me an example of what you might think is a perfect sphere. Anyone? Basketball. I heard basketball. I planted that person in the audience. A basketball is only about 1% perfectly spherical. So that means that its radius can vary from the average radius by a factor of 1%. The sun can vary by 0.0009%. That's crazy. Earth is actually rounder than a basketball, and we know Earth is not a perfect sphere. The correct term to refer to Earth by is called an oblate spheroid. It's kind of like this. It's more stretched out of the equator. So I get paid to crunch numbers, and when I crunch these numbers, I see that the sun is 333 times rounder than the Earth. So that's even rounder than a basketball. OK, and now topic one. So how did it get to that? How did it actually get to be that round? How did it form? Um, Dr. Manny Chen gave us a great introduction to the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. When I say J JWST, I'm referring to that telescope. And this is one of the images that it took. This is not false color. This is what you're seeing just basically in the near infrared. but translated to colors that we would see with our eye. Um, and this is a, an image of a star-forming region. So our sun was born in an environment very similar to this. Uh, you can zoom in and see something in the, in the mid-infrared. So that's even redder wavelengths of light than on the upper right. And then if you really zoom in into sort of one piece of that, of that star-forming region, you get sort of a blobby kind of disc-like thing. And that's, that's basically what, um, what lays the foundation for um, not just the material that will end up on the sun, but the material that will become planets. And that's called a protoplanetary disk. So in this animation, you're going to see what the evolution of these protoplanetary uh, proto disks looks like. Ominous music. So you've got us. Uh, <laughs> you've got the nascent sun there at the center, and it's already gained all the material from this disk. So this disk is what fed the sun in the first 10 million years of its lifetime, um, and then that material, then after feeding the sun, then feeds into what will become planets. So you can, if you look closely, you can see planets starting to form around the star. You can see they're becoming more and more clear, and then the dust sort of dissipates. You see it's getting clearer and clearer, and then you have just basically the star, very much like how we see today in our solar system with the planets orbiting around it. So it's a big cloud of dust that led to the sun. Cloud of dust led to a, led to a disk, led to the sun. And there you go. So that whole process was actually really fast, uh, 10 million years. And something that is really unique in, I think, you know, physics and astronomy is this way of thinking of relative scales. I want you to go back and think of sort of relative scales in your daily life 
Like if you're stuck, you know, listening to your boss at work, just think, you know what, relative to my lifetime, this is like 0.1, 0 0.001%. I don't care, right? Like I don't care what, what they're telling me. So this 10 million years is actually really fast. If you look at this in the context of basically the eras of life on Earth, um, dinosaurs went through three different eras, or sorry, three different periods, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. Um, we're now part of the Cenozoic era. That's where, that's where humans uh, came about. And 10 million years, that's, that's the small chunk. So in that small chunk of Earth's history is what it took so many billion years ago, about 4.6 billion years ago, for the sun to form. So it's a really rapid process, star formation. Okay, is the sun unique? The sun's got to watch its weight. Um, sounds a bit heavy, actually. And this is a, it's a very famous plot. It's a very famous relation in astronomy. Um, it was first posed in 1955, and it still holds for the most part. That, that was a really good sort of, the data was good enough, the theory was good enough in the 50s, and it still basically holds. It's called the initial mass function. And what this is, is, is it basically tells you how common is a star as a function of its mass, as a function of its weight. So just as reference, we're going to put the sun at 1, and we're going to say sun-like stars are 1. Actually, a less massive star, something that's only 20% the mass of the sun, you can see there at point 0.2, that's 10 times as common as the sun. So actually, all these lower mass stars are way more common than the sun, factor of 10. And we've heard a lot in a lot of other astronomy on TAPS about the amazing phenomena that come from more massive stars. Those are very rare. So if you look at stars that have about 10 solar masses, it's only about 0.005 of those stars compared to the sun. So um, basically, lower mass stars are more common than the sun. And solar fact three, the sun's a bit lonely. Yeah. Oh. Um, this is also a really famous plot um, that's pretty recent, actually, from, from 2017. What this says, this is, as a function of solar mass, how many companions does a star have? The way to read this is to say 1, so solar mass star, um, and then there's a 0.5 there. So that says that half of solar-like stars have a twin. So if you just look at any solar mass star in the Milky Way, half of them will have a twin. We don't have a twin. What's remarkable is you look at something that has like you know four solar masses, they basically, on average, the average star that's four solar masses has a twin. And what does it mean when you get like a 30 solar mass star and with a two? That means that the average star that's 30 times the mass of the sun is actually part of a triple. It's a triplet system. That's remarkable. We don't think about that on Earth. We only think about that in Star Wars. <laughs> right? Tatooine, that's actually the, con that's the norm. The norm is actually for stars to have, a, to have a twin. OK, so how does the sun work? This is a, a schematic of the sun. It's actually pretty accurate. Um, it has the core at its center. It has a radiative zone outside of it, a convective zone outside of it, and then all of these layers of the stellar atmosphere outside of it. It's very similar to Earth in that we have cores, we have various layers of the core, and then an atmosphere. Um, the sun has a corona. Notice the a uh, corona, not, uh, not corona. The sun does not have coronavirus. Um, the sun has, has a corona, which is about a million degrees. So it's actually hotter than the atmosphere of the sun itself. And I'll get into that um, a bit later. Um, but the way that heat is transferred within the sun, so all of these layers basically, their names explain what they do. There's a radiative zone, a convection, um, convective, yeah, convective or convection zone. You can think of it as just a boiling pot. You've got a heat source at the bottom. That's the core of the sun. Radiation through the pot or through the air. Um, eventually heats up the water that's inside, so that's the material inside the sun. Um, if you see big bubbles forming when you, uh, when you boil water, that's convection. Hot bubbles rise to the top, they cool down, they sink, and you get this convective process. 
and then you get steam sort of coming out. You can kind of think of the steam as a corona of the sun. Um, starting up the sun, like actually powering this, that's, that's a miracle. And that's really a miraculous process. When this was discovered in quantum mechanics, this was really, yeah, quantum mechanics, all right. Schrodinger would have really appreciated that. So this is a schematic of the nuclear reactions that happen in the sun. It's basically the conversion of hydrogen into helium, something called a PP chain. That's the dominant. Yeah, 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 PP, yeah, yeah. Um, you see, then you make other people laugh that didn't, that were, you know. Um, what's the remarkable part of this process? The, the remarkable part is that there's actually the initial part, getting this started, if you just have any two random uh, hydrogen atoms together, for them to actually fuse and come together, it takes a billion years. Yeah, I heard a lot of swear words. That's great. Thank you. So that means that the sun has a ton of these hydrogen atoms. The sun has so many that you know it has clearly more than a billion because this happens and it powers the sun. It has enough that this process can actually occur. Quantum mechanics is all about random chance, whether things may or may not happen. The probability of this coming together is once every billion years. So the fact that this happens is a miracle. The sun has enough hydrogen. You know, we're alive. OK, fun stuff here. Will the sun swallow the Earth? Let's have this video tell us. So that's Earth. That's the sun. Inflating, inflating. Suspenseful music, please. Yeah, Jaws theme. Yeah, good, good, good. Jaws, Jaws. No. Ah, crap. There goes my timeshare in Cabo. Uh, solar fact five, the sun will swallow the Earth. It's been mostly accepted that that will most likely happen. The only way around it is that the sun will actually migrate outward. Um, the orbit will migrate outward. And even in that case, the surface will get pretty badly scorched. Maybe the sun will lose some mass through solar winds. Sun-like stars typically don't do that. So it'll probably end up swallowing the Earth. Yes. Luckily, we've got five billion years. Um, uh, a friend of mine and, and um, collaborator, Kishle Day, he's given sort of some of these talks in the, in the past. He made a very big discovery in, in the last two years or so of another star swallowing a planet. And the way that, so we know this happens in nature. And that was the first time this was observed. So these two images tell the whole story of the paper. Don't, don't read the like 10,000 10, words that he took so long to write. Um, do read them. So basically, the star in question got brighter. You go through all the physics of how that brightness change occurred. And you work out that basically it was a, it was a sun swallowing a planet. OK, so, as the, so why does that happen? Why does the sun actually expand? Why does it swallow a, a planet? The sun basically just runs out of hydrogen. The sun runs out of hydrogen in its core. And it starts forming hydrogen in its shells. So it pushes the hydrogen out. There's a phase of hydrogen shell burning. Um, and then it basically starts fusing helium together. And that is a process that leads to very, very high temperatures. And it's a very violent process. It's not very efficient. It generates a lot of energy. So it basically causes everything to inflate. A good analogy of this is oatmeal overflow. So you can think of stable, you know, the sun, the sun's normal lifetime. You have your oatmeal cooking. And what's happening is that the water molecules around the oatmeal are being excited. They're being heated up. That's pretty stable. But then once water trapped within the oatmeal starts to heat up, that violently expands the oatmeal, and everything sort of implodes, and it spills in my microwave like this. <laughs> I did this. 
this morning. And I did it for you guys, so hope you like this. Yeah, yeah, scoop good, yeah. And then the, the final topic, so I'm doing a whole life story here. Um, how will the sun live its final days? The next solar fact is that the sun will become what's called a, quote, planetary nebula. It's not, it has nothing, it's a historic term. A lot of terms in astronomy are historic. Um, people basically saw it, and they saw these things in the sky, and they thought, oh, they kind of look like planets. Let's call them a planetary nebula. And they look sort of like this. So now that we have better telescopes, this comes from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we know that's not a planet. We know that there's sort of this gassy, very colorful material around. Th the sun will actually have a very peaceful death. Once it basically starts fusing carbon in its, in its core, its outer layers will very slowly just seep away. Th these are actually a sun-like star's outer layers just sort of floating away. Um, and then you get all the planetary nebula are really cool. I think we might be looking at some in the telescope tonight or other nights. We definitely have them on. And they come in all sorts of different configurations, all sorts of different colors. Remember that I said that a lot of sun-like stars have a twin? If you see some sort of like jets or some symmetry in, in these systems, it's been thought that that's because there's another twin sort of orbiting that star at the center. So that's a relatively sort of new realization in, in astronomy. OK, and I think this is the final or the penultimate solar fact. Um, the sun will live on in the afterlife as a white dwarf star. The sun lives on, yeah. Um, and a white dwarf stars actually are the size of the Earth. They're, they, you know, the radius is about the same as the Earth. The really big difference here is in the density. So you have something that's about half of a solar mass, you know, between half and one solar masses packed inside the density of the Earth. That's a million times denser than the Earth. That material is crazy dense. And they're very dense, and it's no longer fusing hydrogen. It's no longer fusing anything. What supports those stars is pure quantum mechanical pressure. So the very essence of quantum mechanics is, is powering those stars. And they're very faint, they're very small. That's what they look like. This is the nearest white dwarf to us. Um, it's about six to eight light years away. And it's seen as a companion to a much brighter star. So again, this is, this is a theme, you know, s stars have companions, stars are not lonely. And this, this star in this case has a, has a white dwarf star as a companion. Okay, final fact here. So yeah, solar fact number eight. Um, What's really interesting is that our sun, once it lives on in the afterlife, it'll become part of what's called the family of compact objects. And these are the most extreme objects we know of really in the universe. A good way to characterize how extreme an object is is how quickly you need to get away from it. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like, I've got some buddies, you know, they're really extreme. I've got to get away from them really quickly. You've all, you've all been there. White dwarfs are extreme because to escape them, the escape velocity, you have to go 2% the speed of light. The speed of light, not even the fastest spacecraft we have can go even close to that, not even a percent of that. So to get away from a white dwarf, that's how dense, that's how extreme it is. You gotta go 2% the speed of light to get away from it. Another part of this family you may have heard of are neutron stars. So these are even denser, even more compact. To escape these, you've got to go half the speed of light. And sort of the ultimate version of these are black holes, where you just can't escape them. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll take questions.